think I'm not. Okay, am I audible now for those of you who are online? I guess I am. So I'll just go ahead. Yeah, and if there's some problem with the audio, please let me know in the chat. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, we'll be looking at Hosea today and also Joel. So um, Hosea was prophet Hosea, mainly wrote to the um, northern kingdom. All right. So we have some other prophets also who specifically ministered to the northern kingdom. Amos would be another person uh, who ministered to the northern kingdom. However, Amos actually was from the south, and God sends him to the north to uh, prophesy over there. Hosea, on the other hand, was someone living in, north, in the northern kingdom itself, and he makes his prophecies over there. Now, uh, he was alive and in ministry right up to the time that the Assyrians came and uh, defeated the northern kingdom. So most probably, he was among the people who managed to escape when the Assyrians attacked, uh, and he was able to escape and come to the southern kingdom. Okay, so those of you who have still not gotten into the class mode, please concentrate, get focused. And next time onwards, maybe you could actually come a few two minutes before 11 so that you know you don't take time to settle down. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so Hosea was uh, around the same time as Amos. And both of them were ministering in the Northern Kingdom. And around halfway through his ministry is when Isaiah and Micah begin their ministries. So he had a lot of contemporaries. Uh, so along with Hosea, you also had Amos and Isaiah and Micah, all of them ministering around the same time period. Now in his prophecies, he uses a lot of agricultural terms. And that probably is because of his you know, agricultural background. Uh, because he was a farmer. Um, mainly, the main focus of Hosea is the spiritual adultery of Israel. And uh, God speaks about how he has loved Israel and he has remained faithful to them. But on the other hand, Israel has not uh, you know, uh, returned that same commitment. And Israel has always been uh, engaged in spiritual adultery. So that's the main message which comes across in the book of Hosea. And how were they indulging in uh, spiritual adultery? Mainly through their indulgence in idol worship. So they were, they were very strongly into idol worship. And also, of course, there was a lot of injustice going on. The poor be were being um, you know, uh, taken advantage of. A lot of uh, crooked uh, things were going on in the kingdom, and there was no justice. So these are the defects. These are the sinful acts against which Hosea prophesies. So um, almost all commentaries will give you only two main um, sections for this book. Chapters 1 to 3 talk about the faithful husband and the adulterous wife. Hosea being the faithful husband who remains faithful even though Gomer, his wife, uh, goes into adultery and she is unfaithful. So chapters 1 to 3 talk about the faithful husband and the adulterous wife. Chapters 4 to 14, on the other hand, talk about the faithful Lord and adulterous Israel. So we have a um, parallel drawn between Hosea's personal life and God's personal life, you could say. So uh, we see the faithfulness of Hosea and the Lord and the unfaithfulness of Gomer and the nation of Israel. Uh, so it was somewhere around the end of Jeroboam, the second reign, that uh, Hosea begins his ministry. So Jeroboam the second was one of the most powerful kings of the northern kingdom. During his time, there was a lot of military success. They won many battles. They managed to collect a lot of booty from all these um, you know, um, um, nations that they went and attacked. So they were in a very good position financially. Uh, they were respected by other nations around them for their military power. So everything was going excellently well 
during the time of Jeroboam the second, even though he was not following the Lord, even though he was not faithful to God, um, we see that things were going rather well for them as a nation. But when it came to spiritual matters, they were in a very, very pathetic and bad state. So it is around that time that Hosea begins to prophesy and he says, you know, even now it's not too late. Come back to the Lord. Be faithful to him. Be a faithful wife to the Lord. If you will do that, then Lord, the Lord will not bring judgment upon you. But the people did not take him very seriously because all around them, they are seeing prosperity. They are seeing peace because they, they are having victory in all of their battles. So they don't take Hosea seriously. They think, what is there? Even though we are being unfaithful, God is being kind. He's blessing us. So nothing bad will happen to us. That is the impression under which these people were living. So even though he says, God is giving you a chance, come back to the Lord, they refuse to do that. Just for us to know a little bit about um, uh, you know, Gomer, uh, or at least whatever is little bit is mentioned about her in the you know in in the book of Hosea, uh, we would see little background about her in Hosea chapter one verses two and three. So if someone could read out Hosea one. It's interesting to note the command that God gives over here. He says very specifically to Hosea, go marry a promiscuous woman, a woman who is living in immorality. He very specifically says, uh, don't go and marry a normal person, but go and marry a promiscuous woman, a woman who is uh, living an immoral lifestyle. Why? Because she's going to represent this land. And he says, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So in the same way, this land is being unfaithful. This lady too, in her character, she is unfaithful in her ways. She does not respect the Lord. She does not follow the Lord. So go and marry such a person. So um, Hosea has given this very difficult commandment so that he can literally act out in his own life what the people are doing to the Lord. Okay, so, um, so from the beginning itself, Gomer was not very good in her character. And then we see that they get married and they have three children. So I'm not sure how many years Gomer continued to stay uh, with Hosea. Um, I, we do not know how old the children were when she finally leaves because she leaves and goes away to another man. And again, no details are given, but it looks like that for some reason that other person seems to have discarded her, you know, gets rid of her after a while, get, probably gets tired of her. And then we do not know what happens because it looks like Either she goes to other people looking for shelter after this man, you know, leaves her or uh, immediately after that, she's in such a poor condition that she has to go to the you know, slave market and sell herself. We're not really sure of all the circumstances involved. So it was either just one uh, person that she goes to and lives with and then he leaves her or after that, she goes to a number of different men, you know, and they in turn, each of them abandon her after using her for a while. So we don't really know how many years this whole thing, you know, um, how, how, how many months this whole thing takes. But at the end of it, she is left completely penniless. She has absolutely no money, no way of supporting herself. Because if you, you know, remember in the culture of those times, women could not work independently and earn a livelihood. They were either dependent on a father or they would be dependent on a husband or a son. Uh, on their own, they had no financial status. So she would need somebody to look after her. So she probably went from man to man looking for you know, um, shelter, looking for support. And finally, the situation is so bad that she ends up in the slave market where now she would have to sell herself 
you know and be a laborer in someone's field and uh, they would give her the food that she needs every day every day you know to live so she's reduced to that condition and it is at this particular point of time that the lord tells hosea to buy her back so which is why um, hosea goes over there to the slave market to purchase her and uh, we see the details of that in chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 if someone could read out hosea 3 1 to 3 so it's a very lovely passage uh, we see here that um, the lord says over here you know um, love her as the lord loves the israelites though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes you know they love all the um, pagan festivals they like all those ceremonies and rituals which take place in those temples uh those are the things which attract them those are the things which they love in their heart and god who is loving them they don't care about that so that is their attitude and so god says even though the israelites are like that they love those you know those raisin cakes which they offer over there in the temple they prefer that to me so even though they are like that i have still chosen to love them so in the same way you too must go back and love your wife even though she seems to be uh, you know chasing after other persons other men is what the the lord says and in obedience hosea goes over there to purchase her and it it says that he gives 15 shekels of silver and that amount of silver which he gives is not enough to cover the amount because i think probably buying a person is more expensive than just buying an you know a uh, uh, i don't know a, a bullock or a goat or something so the rate was probably high so he gives 15 shekels of silver and it's he doesn't have anything more uh, then he uh, he has barley so he sells whatever barley is there to make up for the balance so we see here a man who cannot really afford buying back this adulterous woman but he you know goes to that effort he gives up all the silver that he has and then the rest of it he pays in the form of you know grain because he has no more silver left in his pockets and uh, this is beautiful picture which comes out of god who was willing to do the same he was willing to give up his all he was willing to give up his son he was willing to give up everything for the sake of adulterous human beings who are not even faithful to the lord so we see a very beautiful picture being brought out over here and also look at the way um, you know um, hosea speaks to her after bringing her back you know he says you are to live with me many days he is not thinking of you know you know throwing her out after a while if she doesn't really behave you know he's not he's willing to keep her there for years many 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 years he says you know what we have a long life ahead of us so you are going to be with me for many days he has absolutely no intention of you know throwing her out and so he says i will behave uh, he says you know you must not be a prostitute uh, and or be intimate with any man and i will behave the same way toward you so he is you know renewing the covenant and saying in spite of all that you have done i'm we'll, you know let's leave that behind us and i will choose to be completely faithful to you and i'm requesting you to do the same for me so that is exactly the offer that god was making to israel at this particular point of time and the lord was saying to them technically you know in spite of all that you have done in the past even now it is not too late i will be faithful to you if you will choose to be faithful to me so this is an offer that the lord is making to the people of israel uh, but then of course you know they reject that offer so um we see that hosea has three children and all of them are given names 
uh, which symbolize the judgment which God wants to bring upon the people. So all of them are given significant names. Mm, when we look uh, at chapter 1, verses 6 to 11, we see the second two children being named. So the second child that Gomer has is a daughter. Of course, all of these things take place before she leaves him and goes away. Uh, but then at that time itself, when the Lord you know, was preparing um, the judgment which is going to come upon uh, upon the northern kingdom. And so we have um, Gomer over here, who's giving birth to a daughter in verse 6, chapter 1, verse 6. And this is the name which is given to her. She is called Lo Ruhama, which basically means not loved. It's a very shocking thing to name a child. The little baby is born. You're holding the little baby in your hands and you're naming that baby not loved. You know, so this does not mean that Hosea and Gomer did not love their child. They did, but they were expressing God's judgment against Israel. And God was declaring and saying, this nation that I have brought up with so much love, uh, they have rejected me. And so now I will declare that they are no longer loved as in, and you know, I'm going to bring judgment upon them. I'm not going to spare them anymore. No more grace is going to be extended towards them. I'm going to judge them. So he says um, uh, in verse 6, Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo Ruhama, which means not loved, for I will no longer show love to Israel that I should um, at all forgive them. And in the very next verse, he says, yet I will show love to Judah and I will save them. OK, so um, even though the northern kingdom is going to be brought under judgment, he says, at least a part of the people I will spare, at least the people of Judah I will spare because his love is so great and he cannot just ignore the love that he feels towards his people. OK, so even though there are words of judgment spoken, there are also words of love spoken along with it, which clearly shows that God never really wanted to judge at all. That is simply not his desire. It's the people who forced him into that position, you know, where he had to bring judgment upon them. So moving to verse 8, um, uh, yeah, uh, verse 9, uh, it's, uh, this is regarding the third child who is born, and this is a boy. And then the Lord said, call him Lo Ami, which means not my people. So all along, God always said, my people, they are my people. And now God says, they're not my people. So uh, both of these names are very powerful, very strong. And uh, there's no way that Israel can ignore what is being done. Because you see those little kids, each time they're going to be running around in the, you know, in the playground playing over there. Everyone is going to look at them and know their names and what their names stand for. And they're going to be aware of the fact that God is speaking judgment. Okay, so um, these are the names given to them. And again, over here, even in this case, the Lord says, Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Ami, which means not my people, for you are not my people and I am not your God. And then in the very next verse, he says, Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. So, um, and then in verse 11, it goes on to say, the people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together. They will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Okay, so even though he speaks strong words of judgment against them, there's always hope attached to that, restoration attached to that. And so he says, even though right now I have declared that they're not my people, a day will come when both Israel, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom will again be reunited. They will come under one leader and then they will walk out in battle to Jezreel. And Jez on that day, great will be the victory which will you know, take place in Jezreel. So let that brings us to the name of the first child, you know, the first uh, son who is born. Uh, if we go back in uh, chapter 1 to verses 4 and 5, the first child is given the name of Jezreel. Now, this word Jezreel was actually meant to be a very positive term of blessing, not a negative word, because that word Jezreel, that term Jezreel basically means God will sow. 
you know, it's like when you're sowing seeds. So it basically is supposed to mean God will sow. And it was actually supposed to have a very positive meaning. Why? Because uh, there was this valley in the land of Israel called the Valley of Jezreel. And that valley was so rich and prosperous and green and, uh, you know, filled with all kinds of goodness that people named it Jezreel, meaning God has sown blessings in this valley. God has caused this valley to prosper. God has, you know, filled this valley with his, uh, with his bountifulness. So it was meant to have a very positive meaning of God sowing blessings. But what happened in that valley later, in the centuries which came after, the people began to use that valley as a place of warfare and bloodshed and violence, which is what we see happening, you know, right from the time of Ahab. A lot of violence and bloodshed happens over there in that particular valley. And so the Lord uh, says, um, so now God gives this valley a different meaning. God will no longer be sowing blessings, but he is going to be sowing judgment. So rather than blessings and prosperity, he is going to sow judgment because of the way the people have chosen to uh, you know, go against his uh, principles. So, Which is why the Lord says in um, chapter 1, verses 4 to 5, Then the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel, for in a little while I will bring the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu. And put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. So what was supposed to be a place of blessing would be turned into a place of judgment. And here you have some specific reference to um, someone named Jehu. And it also talks about the bloodshed of Jezreel. So just for us to get a bit of clarity regarding this whole issue. If you remember when we were doing, um, I think it was don't remember whether it was Kings or Chronicles, but I do remember us covering this particular story uh, where um, Jehu is commanded by God. God says, if you are willing to bring judgment upon Ahab's family, then I will make you the next king. So Jehu is very, very happy with that. And he says, yes, I will go ahead. And so he, go, he kills the northern king, who is a descendant of uh, Ahab. He kills the southern king, who is also a descendant of Ahab. Then he goes to Jezebel. He kills her. Um, then he he doesn't kill her because the, the eunuchs actually throw her from the window and she dies. Uh, then he also kills the uh, descendants of Ahab. So he does all these things. And now, after all of these things have taken place, and um, his descendants, Jehu's descendants, should have understood the moral of the story, that God will not tolerate wickedness, that God will punish wickedness. They should have understood at least that much because of what Jehu did. but. They continue to live the way Ahab and his family lived. So which is why here God says, you know, the judgment which Jehu brought upon the house of uh, Ahab, that same judgment will now come upon the house of Jehu himself because his descendants have not bothered to learn the lesson that God will punish wickedness. He will punish uh, evil and bloodshed. So why is this judgment spoken upon them? It's because after Jeroboam the second, you have another six kings who are left in that lineage. And of those six kings, four of them are murderers. Four of them come to the throne after murdering the person who was sitting on the throne. So four of them come to the throne by murdering someone else. That's the kind of greed for power. That's the kind of violence that is going on in that place. And which is why it says in Hosea chapter 4, verse 2. If someone could read out Hosea 4, 2. Hmm. Okay, they break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. One assassination after another. That's the way these people were living. And that's the way they showed their gratitude for this valley of Jezreel, which God had, you know, be so beautifully sown with prosperity. And uh, so God turns into a place of judgment. So these are some of the main uh, lessons that we see from the book of Hosea. And so this is one last chance that is being given to the people to turn from their ways, to come back and be faithful. But in spite of the 
object lesson which Hosea and his wife are enacting for the people. The people choose to ignore the message and they do not come back to the Lord. Uh, so coming to the book of Joel. Now Joel, on the other hand, was written specifically to the southern kingdom, to the people of Judah. So while Hosea was addressed to, the, to northern Israel, Joel is addressed to southern um, uh, Judah. Okay, so um, now Joel and Amos are the earliest prophets because they give their prophecies long before um, either the northern kingdom or the other southern kingdom had fallen. Okay, so they are like one of the earliest prophets, Joel and Amos. So Joel, um, he is giving his prophecies much earlier and he uses the image of a plague of locusts to talk about the judgment which will come. So um, the book of Joel is mainly known for that whole grasshopper story. Okay, so um, not sure why, but it, uh, that and that book became very popular for that particular image. Um, you know, uh, long time ago, I remember looking at some article on the internet, and they had given a uh, uh, had given a small picture for each book of the Bible. So I remember for the book of Ruth, they had put a, you know, a, a sheaf of corns because she was working in the fields and gathering corn. Uh, for Jonah, of course, you can guess what picture they put. They put a whale. So over here for the book of Joel, I remember they had put a grasshopper, a locust. Okay, Because um, uh, this book is mainly popular for that particular prophecy. So in chapter 1, you have Joel giving a, a prophecy of the of the judgment which God is going to bring, and he uses the image of a plague of locusts. And then chapters two to three, um, you know, God is offering um, a chance for the people to come back. So he says, if they repent and return, then he will forgive them. And uh, in, so in chapter, maybe we could read chapter two. 12 to 13. Yes, if someone could read Joel 2, 12 to 13. Mm. Okay, so here the Lord is saying, even now you can repent and turn back. And what kind of a repentance is God asking for? It says, rend your heart and not your garments. Outward show is very easy. Very easy to know to tear your robe and put on sackcloth and put some ash on your head and say, oh, we are so sorry, oh Lord. But the dirt remains inside. That rebellious attitude continues inside. That is of no use. So God says, rather than rending your robes, Rend your heart inside and genuinely repent of your ways. And he says, if you do that, you know, um, the Lord who is compassionate, slow to anger, he will, you know, restore you. So again, an offer is made to these people and uh, they refuse to, you know, accept it. So there are different images of judgment which uh, Joel uses. One, of course, is the grasshopper thing. He also uses other images. Maybe we, we could look at a couple of verses. Um, so in chapter 1, we will, of course, first look at the main one, which is popular for some reason. Uh, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Someone could. Okay, that is one word of judgment. And then uh, if you can also read out verses 6 and 7. Yeah, yeah, that should be enough. So we see that in all of these images which are used, the main picture that's coming across is complete destruction, where nothing is going to be left. The destruction is going to be so bad that there's nothing left. 
and in fact we see that happening right where finally once jerusalem falls the temple is broken and destroyed the walls are of the city are completely destroyed the people who are living over there are all taken away that place is literally left with nothing so what god says actually does happen so why are these images being used you know it talks about how um, you know this invaders who will come they will have teeth like the teeth of a lion and the fangs of a lioness you know if you have watched any na national geographic you would have seen you know once those lions they go and they bring down a deer or a buffalo or something you know they go in a pack and they attack and they bring it down after about 1 hour you know they show you a clipping of what's left when I mean, what is left you know except for the ribs and you just have some bones over there they literally eat because i mean uh, at least that's what national geographic teaches it says that they get to eat only once in three or four days so like they're really hungry so they literally wipe out everything and when the hyenas come along i think they just lick at whatever is little, little, little bit is left so these invaders are going to have teeth like the teeth of a lion they'll tear it apart till nothing is left okay that's the imagery that is used and then uh, coming to this other very popular imagery of the locusts it talks about four different kinds of locusts um now of course different translations you know um, different english versions will use different wording for it um so i have used the um you know i have in the, what i have noted down over here is the hallman uh, you know uh, version h o l m a n all of these you would find on bible gateway you know bible gateway has got almost every single version that you can think of so um it talks about the devouring locust the swarming locust the young locust and the destroying locust um so a lot of scholars have um, you know given a lot of thought to this particular imagery some of them will say that an actual horde of uh, uh, an actual swarm of locusts came and attacked the land is one interpretation other people will say no 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 it, no actual locusts came to that land it's just that the babylonians are being described as a bunch of locusts who will come and attack and there's a third interpretation which says the locusts are being used as images for all the things that will be done to um, to jerusalem over a long period of time so there are three main interpretations one is that actually literal physical locusts came and ate up the vegetation over there the second um, interpretation is that the babylonians are described like a bunch of locusts and the third interpretation is that uh, the locusts actually are talking about all the future events which will take place in the land of uh, you know juda so these are the three interpretations um i don't know i kind of like the third um, interpretation uh, because there are commentaries which talk about how each of these locusts you know the four categories they seem to be describing the four main empires which came and took over the land of juda and um, that explanation makes quite a lot of sense okay so we'll just quickly look at this third interpretation um but of course you know you're welcome to choose whichever interpretation you feel is best but let us look at what they have to say regarding how these four types of locusts which come in four stages are uh, destroying juda in different ways so the first one um some versions will call it devouring locust some will call it chewing locust the actual word used over there is chewing they chew they will start chewing and eating everything inside uh so anyone who really wants to know about locusts and has not you know paid much attention to them in your entire life all you have to do is go to youtube and type swarm of locusts you know the word swarm s w a r m swarm of locusts the imagery you get in the youtube is like shocking it looks like a cloud it looks like a thick cloud you don't even realize that they are uh, that they that they're little creatures they move in huge billions of them moving and once they come and settle down in a particular place every single green thing available over there they will eat it up they will not leave anything so they, they literally chew everything inside they devour so they you know there are different words used some call it devouring locust some people call it chewing locust uh, so the babylonians did that when they came they destroyed jerusalem completely destroyed its walls destroyed the temple took away all the treasures which were there in the temple took away the people who were there 
they were like a they were like the chewing devouring locusts okay then which was the next kingdom which came along those were the medes and the persians the medes and the persians and uh, for this i think almost all the english vers versions use the same word they use the word swarming locust the word swarm means literally going together in a pack and covering literally covering the uh, the, the the entire ground and so when you look at this youtube videos you see not even one little bit of space is left on the ground you know they 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 they, they, they focus the camera on the ground and you can see that every bit of brown earth is covered with them you can it's like a carpet moving carpet and you can't even see so the medes and persians were like that if you notice it it was their kingdom which you know extended uh, over a large territory for instance this man who married um, you know esther zeres his kingdom extended all the way from uh, where from southern egypt right up to the indus valley in pakistan that was the extent of his thing so they literally swarmed the earth they covered every every bit of the face of the earth or at least the you know what was known as the historically known world at that time they were not very aware of some of the other continents so uh, so they were like the swarming locusts and then which empire came after that you would have the greek empire which comes and um, they are described as the you know in some uh, versions it will it will call them hopper hopper locust some will say creeping locust some will say crawling locust because this is talking about the locusts which come out of the egg and for the first i think 2 months 3 months not particularly sure i don't remember my my youtube video but for some number of months they don't you know they don't develop wings so they can only hop around on the ground and so they they literally creep and crawl into every little bit of gap every little hole in, in the in the ground they will um, they 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 keep hopping around and crawling around and spreading out to all of the uh, territory around them okay till they till they develop their wings so the greek empire was like that in the sense it was able to creep into every one of the other cultures and take over greek culture it influenced even the israelite culture it influenced every the the culture of every nation so that finally when the romans came along the romans what culture did they have they had greek culture okay so they were such a powerful influence and they crept into every area of culture and society and the way things were done even science also they had a lot of influence over that so they are probably compared to the creeping crawling or the hopper locusts and of course the fourth one is the roman empire they are they are similar to the first one because they are they, they are called the destroying locust or the stripping locust uh, because they are the ones who completely you know destroyed um, jerusalem and the temple once again a second time so um, so these are the this they they say that you know we can compare this four categories of locusts to the four empires which came and took over so god was kind of you know giving a long term judgment talking about what are the different ways in which this kingdom would be attacked okay so um i thought maybe then it's another thing that we could look at in uh, the book of joel um it doesn't have to do with any grasshoppers or locusts but it it is something important something useful uh, so if we could have someone read out uh, joel chapter 3 uh, verses 9 to 11 what do you um, you know what would you have to say about this passage which you read out if you were listening and concentrating when you were reading it was there something mentioned here which is like little different from what you generally hear is there anything mentioned here in this passage which is kind of different from what you generally hear in sermons and you know in popular teachings i'm uh, specifically talking about verse 10 
yeah over here they're being asked to turn their agricultural um, uh, instruments into weapons of war generally what do we hear in the sermons the reverse where you're commanded to turn the instruments of war into agricultural implements because you won't there won't be war anymore there's going to be peace which is correct is joel correct or is the other bible passage correct that actually would be your isaiah chapter 2 verses 3 to 5 so and and the same thing in fact is repeated again in micah chapter 4 verse 3 so let's look at that as well um and then you know we can compare the two isaiah chapter 2 verses 3 to 5 if you could read out Isaiah 2, 3 to 5. Okay, so in the Joel passage, you have a commandment saying, come. Again, over here in the Isaiah passage, you have a commandment saying, come. But then there are two different things. In Joel chapter 3, verse 11, it says to the nations, God is speaking to the nations and he says, come quickly, all your nations from every side and assemble there. Okay, in the Isaiah passage, again, there's a commandment to come. But over here, the command is being given to the descendants of Jacob and it says, come descendants of Jacob. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. So in the first passage, the Joel passage, it's talking about um, God telling the nations to take all their agricultural instruments and turn them into weapons of war because a lot of war is going to come. A big battle is going to happen. In fact, he commands and he says, uh, you know, in uh, verse um, 11 come quickly all your nations from every side and assemble there because you know you have all been talking and grumbling against me so come now actually come with your weapons come with your war you know with your warfare uh, you know equipment come and gather over there let's fight okay so god is saying is encouraging and saying come let us have a big battle on the other hand in your isaiah passage it's like as if all the battles and all the wars are already finished and so now God is saying, peace has been established. Everyone can now peacefully go to the mountain of the Lord and celebrate over there, worship over there. You won't be needing any more weapons of war because the war is finally finished. The victory has been established. And so now there won't be any need for your swords. So you can take your swords and turn them into agricultural implements. So it's basically said that Joel chapter 3 verse 10 is talking about the um you know the wars which will take place during the seven years of tribulation especially the battle of armageddon where all the nations will gather together they will come there with their weapons of war because they want to fight god because they actually believe that they can win a battle against god okay so they see the 12 chapter 3 verse 10 is probably talking about those seven years of tribulation when the whole world will want to wage a war against God. They will want to express their rebellion against him. On the other hand, Isaiah chapter 2, 4 and Micah 4, 3 are talking about the millennium period which will come after the battle of Armageddon. At that time when peace is established and there is no more warfare that you need to worry about, at that time, you know, in fact, when Satan is removed from the earth at that time, so at that time, it would be world peace and you would not need any kind of weapons anymore. Okay, so um, th that is the kind of uh, message which is being brought out over here. So Joel is talking about the first phase and Isaiah talks about the next phase when there would be no more war left. Uh, these are just some things that I could touch upon. Um, of course, there, there'll be, there'll always be other extra things, but then of course we don't have time. Anyone wants to ask any doubts, questions?
<laughs> oh, the question asked over here is about the children of Hosea, how they would have felt having names you know, which say not loved, not my people. Uh, so I think Hosea and Gomer would have told them what God said in the next verse. You know, there's always uh, restoration attached. And of course, they would be told that they are ambassadors carrying a word of judgment. It's not that it's being the, the names are not direct being directed at them, but they are going to be carrying those names as ambassadors who are declaring to the uh, to the entire nation what God is going to do. So in a way, they can feel very you know uh, happy about the special status and privilege which they have been given because the average kid is not going to be proclaiming any judgment, but these kids are going to be wherever they go, they're going to be carrying that word of judgment along with them. So there's a positive side to it. I'm sure those kids were not traumatized. <laughs> I, I think things worked out all right for them. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? No. OK, we'll close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for uh, the lessons that you teach us from your word during every single class. Thank you, O Lord, that your word is filled with things which we can take and apply to ourselves and be encouraged by. So we thank you, Lord, for uh, Hosea. Thank you for his faithfulness in choosing to, uh, to, to be used by you uh, to give an object lesson to the people. And Lord, I thank you for that those words of hope and restoration which you spoke, even though you were speaking words of judgment. So we thank you, Lord, that you are a God who is slow to anger and full of compassion. And Lord, so therefore, help us not to be foolish like the people of Israel. Help us not to be stubborn like the people of Judah, but to take hold of this beautiful grace and compassion that you're offering us and to genuinely change our ways. Help us, O oh Lord, to stop the outward show of rending our garments. And Lord, instead, really, O oh Lord, in private, in down on our knees in front of you, help us to rend our hearts and really make a new commitment to you, O oh Lord, so that uh, we can enjoy the blessings which you have for us. Because, O oh Lord, you want to be a God who wants to sow peace and prosperity into our lives, not a God who wishes to sow judgment into our lives. So, oh Lord, help us to remember these lessons and help us, O oh Lord, uh, to apply these things in our own lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for paying attention. Uh, those of you who are here and also those of you who are online, thank you. <laughs>